coming tonight. I'm Curtis Dozier from the Department of Greek and Roman Studies, and I'm very excited to welcome you tonight to this year's great lecture by Nancy Sherman. I, uh, I first want to thank my colleagues in Greek and Roman Studies and uh, President Bradley for their support of this uh, event, as well as the Departments of Philosophy, Political Science, Psychological Sciences, and International Studies for uh, co sponsoring the event tonight. When, when I came to Vassar 11 years ago, uh, the department was in the process of redesigning our curriculum to put connections between the ancient and contemporary world at the center of what we do. And, and we, we did this partly as a way of making the argument for the continuing relevance of the ancient world to contemporary concerns, but it was also an attempt to find new arguments for why we should study Greco Roman we used to just say that this was worthwhile because we'd say things like, these are great and admirable civilizations, uh, these civilizations are the foundation of ours. And, and actually a lot of uh, classics departments still rely on those kinds of arguments, even though they ring increasingly false. These supposedly great civilizations relied on, for the most part, did not question slave labor. They restricted the civil and political rights of women, in some cases as severely as the most oppressive, uh, oppressive regimes of the contemporary world. And they used violence to impose their political will on others. And although you can make an argument that the rebel movement in antiquity contributed to many things we hold dear, like democratic institutions, rational inquiry, the development of literary Ancient civilization has also been foundational for oppressive politics, nationalism, and white supremacy right then into the present age. So clearly a more critical approach to the study of antiquity is needed, one that simultaneously insists on the value of the study of the classical past, but one that is also willing to question the authority that we sort of so often get to that past. So it's a real pleasure to introduce to you tonight Nancy Sherman, whose work on ancient ethics, ancient stoicism, and the experiences of contemporary soldiers and veterans serves as an outstanding example of the power of bringing together critical readings of ancient texts and the contemporary world. Professor Sherman is University Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University and is also affiliate faculty at Georgetown Center on National Security and the Law, as well as the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. Among many books and articles, including heavy-duty treatments of Aristotelian ethics and a major collection of essays on Aristotle, Professor Sherman has written three major books on the soldiers and veterans who have been fighting our nation's still ongoing wars. This work grew out of her experience as the first distinguished chair in ethics of the U.S. Naval Academy, and the hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of interviews with soldiers and veterans that she has conducted since then. Her most recent book is After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our Soldiers, and it takes on the question of the moral obligations of civilian society toward the close to three million men and women who have served in our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is urgent and necessary work, because Americans have never been less familiar with actual soldiers and actual military life than they are now. I'm proud to say that Vassar is a leader in addressing this divide in higher ed, at least. We have an ongoing exchange with West Point, where Vassar students and West Point cadets meet and socialize, and also from time to time spend a day in the life on each other's campuses. And Vassar was the first school in the United States to, posse with the posse, to partner with the Posse Foundation in New York City to form a Posse Veterans Program that admits 10 Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans every year to Vassar, and where they become full participants in the life of our campus. But the divide between the civilian and military world is real. I remember going to the Vietnam War Memorial with my father when I was growing up and watching him go through the index of names of those who had died. These are all people he had known in high school, name after name after name. People in his generation, almost all of them knew many people who served in Vietnam. Whereas I, before I started advising in the veterans program here on campus, I had only known one soldier in my entire life. Professor Sherman's work, above all, seeks to understanding, <coughs> seeks to build understanding between those who have served and those who haven't. So the contemporary relevance of Professor Sherman's work is beyond question. It's been recognized and praised in many places that I bet you know, the New York Times, Atlantic, the Washington Post, This American Life. 
But what makes Professor Sherman such a no-brainer for us to invite him to Martin Friedman for Roman Studies is her approach to antiquity. Her first book on veterans was called Stoic Warriors, and in it she did exactly what we try to train our students to do. She took a critical look at the ways that ancient Stoic thought had been adopted by the U.S. military and its soldiers. Her conclusion was that aspects of ancient Stoicism that she observed being talked about, basically a kind of stiff upper lip or suck it up mentality, could be found in ancient thought, but were to a large degree harmful in the contemporary world to those who adopted them. And so what Professor Sherman has done uh, is then recognize that suck it up doesn't work in the contemporary world, but that it also helps us recognize that ancient thinkers themselves, although they sometimes argue for suck it up, actually recognize the inadequacy of that approach. And so she uses the contemporary world to re reveal a side of ancient Stoic thought that might otherwise have lain hidden, an approach to the good life that allows us to recognize our lives as a journey, that allows empathy, and especially self-empathy, and that insists on the need for each of us not to become Stoic, invincible sages, but to recognize our dependence on others and their dependence on us. Please welcome Nancy Schoen. wanted to fly since junior high, and the Naval Academy, like the Air Force, took a guy with a knee injury. Um, and uh, not only did he do well at the Naval Academy, but he soon discovered that he had the physiology to fly, to be an aviator. He was a G monster, as they say, able to withstand 9G over time in the spin and puke centrifuge. He could physically endure and had made peace with killing uh, when he took to be uh, self-defense of killing of enemy combatants in what he thought was just war ways. But one of them early on in his career unhinged him. And it was a midday strike uh, on a radio relay station in northern Kosovo, May 1999. Intelligence imagery was grainy, and in order not to alert the Serbian defense forces, he had to go south of the target and then swing back. And the air crews now had less time to make sure they were locked on the right target. Um, and then Serbian air defense also opened up. But still, he felt pretty good about the target. I felt good about the release. And then, then, then it got a bit cloudy. The imagery got a bit grainy. And he had 15 seconds to think. Um, I didn't say anything, but we took out what I took were exactly what we were targeting with two GBU guided bomb unit 12. So, Mega bombs. Then dread started to mount. McDowell looked at the strike footage once found on the carrier, and he saw that what he struck was a car portal, and he saw unmistakably four bikes, two of which were child sized. Now, there was never any legal proceedings. I had many conversations with Chris Chickers. Um, they were never able to get full Pentagon release information on this, but the moral burden was carried by this naval aviator. And it, the after-incident debriefing came in a repetitive dream. And it played just before he deployed in Iraq 2005. And in the dream, he was back at the bombing site, and he went into the house, and the house was covered with dust and dangling wires. And unmistakably, in the corner was a small child. 
He lifted the boy to his chest, tightly cupping his head and his hand, but the front of his face was obliterated. And in the dream, the boy was his son, his son of fat lamb. So I tell this salient case of moral injury because it's it's not one of collateral killing or not that. This was accidental killing. And unlike some collateral killings that they justified as necessary militarily, because you have a high target, a, 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 a important target, um, or excused as part of eliminative killing and militarily necessary, accidents like these, they abound in war, are never justified as necessary or eliminative killings. They're not proportional to the end you're trying to achieve. The act is transgressive of someone who's not liable to be killed, namely this child. And even if the individual's acts, the uh, perpetrator's acts, can be legally or morally excusable, as perhaps in the above case, you could say bad intelligence came from high up or fog of war kinds of facts, so diffuse lines of responsibility and fog of war kinds of issues, still innocents have been wronged. And the moral burden is carried by this aviator in a repetitive dream, an intrusive dream, and flashbacks, and in growing lukewarm over 13 years in flights that he used to enjoy making. He wishes for some atonement and some compensation to the victims, but it hasn't gone through. So what's puzzling about the salient case of moral injury is that the transgression that causes so much distress doesn't run afoul of the moral and legal codes of war. The agent can't extirpate himself, though the doctrine of war can. Now, we could say, as many colleagues do, well, this is just the grandiosity of moral agency at work, especially war fighters, and especially you know a little bit about the environment at West Point or the Naval Academy or the Air Force Academy. Um, war fighters, especially officers, raised on perfection and zero tolerance for screwing up whether keeping a rifle clean or in hitting a target with expensive <coughs> precision munitions. Many hold themselves to use a military, uh, a law term strictly liable, uh, even when they ought not. But I think that shunting all or most military injury to psychological overreach misses the greater moral landscape. Even if moral sensitivities don't accurately track what's permissible and impermissible, so some individuals may be moral wantons, though they incur war crimes and atrocities. They go to oh, Lieutenant Cali, Captain Dino, and the Eli Massacre. Um, others overly self-blaming in the face of foolish and tragic moral luck. They often do point to some phenomenon that's morally relevant, but often missed by modern moral criteria, oh, and including just war theory that looks just at what an action is, if it's just or not just. So I think that point is fundamentally Aristotelian. It's an ancient point uh, that virtue is a matter of apt actions and emotions. Moral injury, as I'll argue, and its related emotions, experienced um, and often expressed in speech or comportment, are deeply connected to virtue and aspirations to it. And granted, some injuries may be just so debilitating as to corrode moral character. Um, others um, may not undo character, but come from an undone character and eliciting moral injury, feeling shame as the beginning of redemption, possibly. But still others may be less severe and overall signs of healthy moral character and may be adaptive. And if the soldier didn't feel those emotions of laying down, didn't feel the remorse over likely killing children, we wonder about his humanity. So this brings me to my topic today. I think there is a tension in the military world and in popular culture in general between a growing recognition of moral injury, and it doesn't happen to be, have to be in the military world. It can be in all sorts of places where uh, there are grievous inter interpersonal interactions that take place and, and, and there's suffering. A growing 
recognition of moral injury, but now military moral injury, as often a healthy expression of the moral conscience of the service member, and a very strong attraction, as Curtis was saying, to stoic notions of virtue that seem to require weaning oneself from the disquiet of emotions, constitutive of moral injury, like guilt, or shame, or remorse, or resentment of the public. Um, and so on. So the question put bluntly is, is moral injury compatible with a stoic view of resilience? And is it an emotionally view of, of resilience that the Stoics really offer? Or, again, to take a critical look at the Stoics, are there more nuanced Stoic accounts of virtue and emotion that we can draw from? And in saying this, my concern is not just academic or textual. Um, it has to, I've been involved with educating the military, both in returning veterans who come to Georgetown for undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees, PhDs, security studies, but also at the academies. And it has to do with education and what we take from that reading. And if Roman Stoics, such as Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, or Seneca and redactors such as Cicero are sources of inspiration for training military virtue and resilience. Are we reading all the right lessons when we read those texts? What do we miss that could be extremely helpful uh, in recognizing and healing, more to the point, moral injury? So, I can move this along. The plan is this. Uh, this is my worry that I just outlined. Are we reading the right lessons from the Stoic text? And a hidden message is reading some Seneca. <laughs> um, and um, what I want to do is look at uh, a philosophical lens on moral injury uh, after I give you a more clinical one. Uh, talk a little bit about the Stoics on emotions and how they would represent morally injurious emotions. Uh, talk a little bit about moral distress, uh, that may be a kind of moral injury, especially as presented uh, by uh, the trope of Alcibiades' tears that is brought up again. Cicero comes in the symposium. And then look at the end um, at uh, Seneca on Mercy and a uh, quite remarkable play, I think. I think you offered that I'm not a scholar on this. Um, Trojan Band. That's the, that's the roadmap. So let's think a little bit about moral injury. Uh, the leading research in clinical mental health professional, professionals working on moral injury uh, through the VA system uh, and, and uh, the DOD, uh, and this is primarily Brett Litz's team, uh, LITZ. Sheridan Quinn and Bill Nash, uh, define it as a syndrome of shame, self-handicapping, anger, and demoralization that occurs when deeply held beliefs and expectations about moral and ethical conduct are transgressed. Sometimes it's referred to as a kind of cognitive dissonance. You believe one thing, you're a good person, and then you go to war and come out not thinking that you've really sinned. But cognitive dissonance doesn't get to the emotional trauma that's at stake here. And most argue that the transgressions can arise from the point of view of the agent um, or from others toward you, where you're the victim, or from the point of view of close-up observer. War journalists such as uh, Chippers certainly are subject to moral injury. The critical piece of the research that will um, resonate with uh, those thinking about the Vietnam era and soldiers coming back from Vietnam is that it's not just fear-based trauma. Post-traumatic stress, which was a diagnosis that came out um, where there was a group of individuals studying both Vietnam veterans returning, but also women that lost a lying in hospital that were sexually assaulted. Um, they were suffering similar symptoms that had to be, uh, came out uh, in uh, symptoms of hypervigilance, withdrawal and dissociation, and um, intrusive, uh, intrusive memories, intrusive thoughts. The issue there is primarily fear of life threat. In the case of 
moral injury, it's not security threats that are the focus, but rather moral challenges or moral issues. Still, the symptoms can be similar. Emotional numbing, arousal, hypervigilance, avoidance. Now, my own work is not as a clinician. I have psychological training, but I do not see patients. And I've long argued that it is wrong to think of all moral Military moral injury is pathological or maladaptive, as I've suggested earlier. And that is in no way to minimize the critical work of therapy. I would urge a national campaign on destigmatizing mental health therapy, which should come in the military role from the command top down. Um, my worry is just that model lenses often don't get us to look at the phenomena carefully enough. And most in the clinical world would agree, and there are many projects now partnering uh, with folks like myself and those that are in the clinical world that work through the VA and the like. Uh, so moral injury can signal, as I'm suggesting, a morally conscientious soldier working out consciously or probably, in the case of McDowell, subconsciously, moral accountability in war. Uh, and the even unprocessed moral disquiet can be an important first step in an individual reaffirming, reaffirming personal accountability and in strengthening sensitivity. So think of uh, a fighter feeling pangs of guilt in the wake of a very permissive collateral killing of a high value target, say in the case of Zarkawi, the right, strike of Zarkawi, where it's likely it was known in advance there were family members with him. Or the shame I hear a lot about and high-stake political dealing with a shady but allied warlord in Afghanistan. Or, another case I write about, um, a sense of command betrayal tinged with shame and being the bearer of very paltry constellation solace money for civilian families on the crosshairs of a, of, a, of, a, of a return strike. Assume the emotions in these cases are morally warranted. Guilt in an undeserved collateral killing, sort of Gary's children, shame in accepting the terms of how you have to do business in this war with shady warlords, moral disappointment and distrust in your commander for giving you paltry zit, zil, uh, zilch money, 700 bucks, in the case of one of the guys I talked to, uh, for repayment for a family that lost three family members. So the emotions look back, but they also look forward to um, missions that might have gone differently, or to um, moral accountability, even if it's collective and not just uh, solo. So when I think about moral injury, I often use the lens of the philosopher P.F. Strassen. And Strassen talked about reactive attitudes. They're essentially, um, basic concern and demands that we have to be treated with goodwill and regard. And they're parts, part and parcel constitutive of the responsibility practices, practices that show up in our crazy and blaming of ourselves, of others, on behalf of others. And uh, as I said, and to lead with moral accountability in some ways is to get away from pathologizing or moral injury. I think the DSM Diagnostic and Statistics Manual is critical, especially for medical boards. You serve, you get injured, you get compensation. Um, and these are complicated matters that go that take long times to get resolved. But it's also important for the general public to depathologize and for soldiers themselves to understand certain uh, aspects of moral accountability that aren't just part of the medical syndrome. So that's uh, how I entered this. So I introduced earlier uh, uh, a tension within current military culture that accepting some level of moral disquiet as a healthy response to the conflicts posed by war, and an embrace of a stoic, idealized model of uh, sort of uh, stripped down emotions. Uh, freedom from emotional distress, stoic calm or tranquility. 
And so these are broad trends. I'm not suggesting one individual holds both of them in some inconsistent ways. I'm just suggesting that just as we're beginning to accept moral injury as a very pervasive phenomenon in the military world with all spectral degrees of it, there's also this wild uptick in interest in stoicism within the military, but also in the tech world. Um, the tech world follows the quotable Stoics regularly. If they could go to work in Silicon Valley and tell this, they might. Um, <laughs> so can we bring these two uh, conflicts together? So I'm going to suggest we can, and I'm going to begin with um, Seneca. But first, let me just give you a sense of the face of moral injury. This is a man who only got $750, Jeff Hall, for consolation money, where a family of three bodies were rotting. He couldn't even bury them. When he finally got to bury them, uh, marked in bold red letters was enemy combatant, though they were a Christian family caught on crosshairs on a Sunday afternoon. And it, he said, it's not PTSD. That's I'm doing me is the moral injury. In this case, he thought the command just could not wrap their head around supporting him. But also, the Ministry of Health, the Iraqi Ministry of Health, uh, was not helping either and partnering this week. This is a mask he made of Walter Reed. This is a horse he drew, mired in mud. I was told actually just two weeks ago in Annapolis by. Um, uh, a chapel who works at Walter Reed that she saw the sequel to this where the horse wasn't admired in mud. So that was very moving to me. I didn't see it. This is Jess and his family. So having two children killed in an attack very much resonated with his father of two. <coughs> These are drawn from National Geographic that did a series based on masks that Melissa Walker, an uh, art therapist and psychotherapist at Walter Reed, the best in the worked on the uh, uh, vets in, well, not vets, actually, uh, DOD, most uh, active service members in the Nike Center, National Intrepid Center. I'm going to run through these. Some of them are on the wall, some are in display in the national headquarters of the VA. TBI is traumatic brain injury, uh, which has a kind of concussive disorder, but can have some of the symptoms also of PTS and moral injury. This is his team, but it was a litter. Uh, art modality that works in conjunction with sometimes dance modalities and also uh, talk therapy and medicine, yoga, meditation, and all sorts of things. Question mark. That's so here we come to Seneca. So Seneca the Younger, so 3 BCE to 65 D, the one most of us know, is an important source, I think, for he's a pragmatic philosopher. Though he's not caught in the fog of war, he is caught in the muddy currents of politics. He swims in those currents um, as Nero's tutor, political advisor, speech writer, and so on. And uh, just a few historical details here. Um, should suffice. He comes to the court through the interventions of young Nero's mother, Agrippina, who sought him out as a tutor with the most famed reputation in the empire for the rhetoric and public, for rhetoric and public speaking. She became his patron, uh, bringing him out of Corsica, where he was for about eight years, um, and getting Nero closer to the throne through the powerful pen of Seneca was part of her motive. So Seneca's motives then became keeping the boy in power. I think he takes the throne at 16. 
uh, even though it soon involved keeping the mother out of favor as she fell out of favor with her son. And so there's no shortage of intrigue in this palace where Seneca lurks in the background or maybe the foreground. Um, there's the poisoning of Claudius's biological son, Britannicus, when he became of age to take the throne. A plot which Seneca's palace insider probably was aware. And though Agrippina was his benefactor in getting him into the palace, Nero showed, excuse me, uh, Seneca showed him limited gratitude um, uh, uh, when he defended Nero's murder for a speech which records suggested to go down well with all. So what comes around goes around in this short biography, and Nero's anger may have been a restrained on occasion, but by no means ever managed. And Seneca must have been well aware of this um, and the threat against his own life, given attempts to retire from public life uh, in his later years, and his general preoccupation in those years of writing about more serene matters and issues of tragedies of power and mortality. And then Seneca, of course, is uh, forced to commit suicide um, after being accused of the Soviet plots. And this is Rubens, and he doesn't seem very calm. He looks like a lot of muscles are twitching, etc. As, as he tries over and over to commit suicide. So why do I offer this mini bio? It's because when Seneca writes about clemency or anger or constancy or rails against the evils of materialism and luxury, he writes as no moral or political naive. He knows the pull of wealth and power and the perils of trying to escape it under the tyranny and eye of the watchful tyrant. He takes up his pen and well-trained stoic stance, in part to calm his own fears and to aspire to something pure. As he often uh, uh, says he's the doctor as well as the patient. Um, and um, you know, he could have stayed clear of Nero, as maybe others did, um, Epictetus, et cetera. But, um, and he could have opted for his own suicide rather than being forced to it. So in short, he's a pragmatist, a, a puzzling pragmatist who's been in the political trench trenches, suffered its glory and infamy, and yearns for some personal moral change. And Stoicism appeals in this case. And that's at least one way, uh, one way to read the moral essays, letters, and tragedies. So what kinds of moral emotions might uh, Seneca and other Stoics help us out with? Well, just some basics. The first is that emotions on the Stoic view are kinds of chosen actions. They are volitional. You assent to an impression of some injury happening, some good or evil out there. And they're volitional types of actions, but they're irrational in two ways. The first way they're irrational is one started part to stop, especially anger. You're like a runner in stride, and you can't stop your stride. You just sort of um, you go beyond the human reason, you might say. A second way in which they're irrational is that they're perverse valuations. They're false valuations. You just get wrong what is good and evil. You think a good is luxury, is power, is honor, is badges on your chest, is elevation of your career ladder. No, a good is virtue and virtue alone. You think an evil is losing your daughter, uh, of the death of a buddy, in battle, um, uh, a surrender to the enemy, you know, it's vice, and virtue is avoiding vice. So you get the object of your attachments wrong. That's a false evaluation. However, we would be blind and emotionally unintelligent, or unintelligent, if we didn't have some uh, guidance for emotion. So they allow in two different classes of emotions. One of them is often called proto-emotions, proto arousal, starts and startles. And Seneca's particularly good in on anger in letting us know about those. And he has a military model in mind at points. In time of peace, a military man in civilian clothes pricks up his ears at the sound of a trumpet. He still sort of feels the tinkle, even though he might not really um, 
be aroused by a full-blown ordinary emotion. These are involuntary starts and struggles, and it doesn't appear in your virtue in any way to suffer them. They're not false evaluations. They catch you off guard. And if you nip them in the bud, you can proceed to regain emotional management and control. There's another way um, that um, the most perfect example of virtue, a sage, person of practical wisdom, might not be fully emotion free. Um, not only having these start and startles, but having healthy emotions or eupathetic emotions, good emotions. And these are ones where they are directed at virtue and the avoidance of vice. So the desire is not for the objects of appetite, but for virtue. Joy is in virtue, and fear is not for losing external bliss or being threatened by their loss, uh, but rather losing virtue for its uh, caution or an awareness of moral compromise and the like. So, Seneca himself doesn't go through that taxonomy in full detail, but there is something interesting in the ancient uh, Stoic taxonomy, and that is they leave no room for distress. That is the null set. So why is it the null set? In part because the sage should feel no distress. Nothing really, there's no evil, no wrongdoing of his own or her own that would disquiet the psyche. That's just not a possibility if you're not perfectly virtuous. So what if you're not? What if you are, like Seneca says, he always is, just a moral progressor, a moral learner, an aspirant, aspiring to become better but subject to error, occasional misevaluations of what's really worthy, caught in struggles with those in power who compromise your moral autonomy, caught in the struggle with a country that is on this goal goes to war with you, the war you don't think is just. Um, permissive rules of engagement that allow you to do things where you're not sure in fact those are permissible. So many of for many of us the compromises may not rise to the level of imperial court intrigue with execution, poisoning, and banishment um, as punishments. But the basic condition of not being sin-free and yet aspiring to become better is in part, I think, what has appealed to the readers of Seneca throughout the ages um, beginning the Christian period. So what about that backward glance that propels us forward into a stance of moral progress? Part of it is that that backward glance is packed with emotion, <coughs> packed perhaps with remorse, or regret in the case of not real wrongdoing, but an accident that where you're a proximate causal uh, a cause. Disappointment, etc. Those are the is impulses, I think, of moral aspiration. And I think the Stoics argue that that kind of distress often gets the evaluation right. And while how we act with those evaluations may spiral us downward, possibly even into suicidal uh, fantasies or uh, executions, they may move us forward into moments of understanding how we could have done better, or if we did wrong, forgiveness, mercy, atonement, and reinstatement into the moral community. So let's look at the sources here. I mentioned Alcibiades before. So at the conclusion of the symposium, some of you may remember um, a banquet, a kind of satyr-like thing, a table uh, in honor of the god of Eros, Alcibiades, the morally flawed and would, would soon be known to history as the disastrous military leader who trained Athens to Sparta, bursts into the drinking party and addresses his love ode, so to speak, directly to Socrates, his moral tutor. And he says to Socrates and to the other guests present that Socrates is the only one who can really hold a mirror up to him. 
and show him his errant ways and bring on the tears of shame. He says that anguish is at, some, at times excruciating, especially in the presence of Socrates. So we presume Alcibiades' superego isn't that well developed. He needs the spur of an outside uh, moral source. Um, and he says, you know, I've, I've grossly neglected my character for the sake of military honors and a political career. Now, Alcibiades is a tormented soul. He is not an ordinary bureaucratic or weak old person. He's rather someone who knows clearly what he should do, but doesn't do it. And he may occasionally step into the waters of virtue, but not often enough. So he's not sure he really knows how to live a life of virtue, but he's willing to try and taste it, especially in the presence of Socrates. Alcibiades gives us a sense of just how non-scalar for some, and the Stoics, the external goods are and virtue. They're different worlds. The world of honor and luxury is really gives you a different kind of good than the world of virtue. And Alcibiades may not really know how to get into that other world. But it still gives you a sense of what might propel you forward. And the tears of Alcibiades become a, a, a challenge for Stoic thought as to how to incorporate moral distress as a part of moral improvement. So Cicero, as I mentioned, not himself a Stoic, but a redactor, often attracted to its ways, especially in Tuscan disputations, says that Cleantes, that's the second um, of the three Greek patriarchs in Stoic school, doesn't take seriously enough the problem. He says, it seems to me that Cleantes doesn't take sufficiently into account the possibility that a person might be distressed over the very thing which Cleantes himself counts as the worst of evils. For we're told that Socrates was persuaded Alcibiades he was unworthy to be called human. It was no better than a manual labor, despite his noble birth. Alcibiades got very upset, begging Socrates with tears to take away this shameful character and give him a virtuous one. You see how easy Alcibiades thinks the transformation is. Um, Cleantes, surely you would not claim that the circumstances which occasioned Alcibiades' distress weren't really a bad thing. Again, he says, Suppose a person's upset about his own lack of virtue, say his lack of courage or responsibility or integrity. The cause of his anxiety, isn't that itself an evil? So Cicero is challenging the Stoics. Don't you think there are moments of moral distress where you catch what you did that was wrong and now stand in the position through that conscientious look backwards to go forwards? And I think Seneca himself recognizes this, and Cicero is certainly pointing out that he ought. So one thought here is that the Stoics should view distress or moral injury as a possible moment of moral aspiration, of moral healing, of moral moving forward. In the case of real moral shortcomings or transgressions, the disquiet may be a first stage, an impulse or motive toward moral growth and repair. Maybe it has to be elicited externally. Some who commit atrocities, I presume, are not easily going to feel remorse. It may take years and years, and they may fight it all the way, the legal proceedings on their side. In the case of only apparent transgressions, say anguish that one's morally and not just causally responsible for non-negligent accidental harms to civilians or battle buddies. There may be a, a, a shame that has to be let go and not felt as hard as it can be felt. So are there ways in which we can insert Seneca's voice in there, for example, to think about moral aspiration through moral distress? So I think Seneca finds plenty of room for this in his writings. And the, I, this, I think, comes up especially in On Mercy. In writing it, Seneca says he holds up a mirror from Nero to better see himself, but also clearly for Seneca to see himself, too. And 
The essay's dark twin, I think, is uh, the Trojan Woman. I want to close with that, and it will bring us back to where we started. But first, just a little bit on the essay. So mercy in the essay is, is cast as the humane virtue in a world of human frailty. So it's already saying the sage isn't our only model. We need to think of not an ideal moral virtue as well. And Seneca says it's not, mercy isn't pardon or the remission of a deserved punishment, but leniency in exacting a punishment. And he says it's a staying of the head, a restraint, a calming of vengeful anger. We've all sinned, some in serious, some in trivial things, some from deliberate intention, some by chance impulse, or because we were led astray by the wickedness of others, some of us have not stood strongly enough by good resolutions. So even if we become perfectly virtuous, we would have arrived there by some moral erring along the way. There's no sinless path for moral progress, is the idea. So he says it's the gentler side of Stoicism. Um, <coughs> now, how does it show up? I think it shows up in the Trojan women in a rather interesting way. Um, and it, there's a plea for mercy here. And this is Andromeda's plea to Ulysses, which is in the concluding scenes of the Trojan women. But just back up first. The play is really graphic. It is a brutal expose of post-war violence. The Roman spectator, of course, seems to need this. It feeds on this gratuitous violence. The forum could fill maybe 50,000 at lunchtime for gladiator recreation. But the violence here isn't of slaves or prisoners tossed to mad and beasts. Rather, it's Trojan women and children at the mercy or the lack of it of the Greek captors. So the, the Greeks, despite their victory, find themselves once again stuck without the right winds to set sail. And following the familiar script, Calchas, the Greek priest, recommends Hector and Andromache's young baby son, Astyanax, be sacrificed. And by the way, too, Polyxena, the young daughter of Priam and Hecuba, the Trojan king, be slaughtered as a war bride on Achilles' tomb by Achilles' proxis, his son, Pyrrhus. So rape of the women and pillage of property aren't enough. The children must bear the, bear the crimes of their fathers and Hector's baby boy, importantly, thwarted from ever becoming a child of a man warrior who could reignite the cycle of the Trojan War. Agamemnon urges Pyrrhus, <coughs> in this case, not to avenge his father's death with such shocking bloodshed. And the plea for mercy makes its first appearance here. First, learn the crucial lesson. There is etiquette to victory, a limit to defeat. Those who abuse their power never stay in power long. Moderate governments survive. Here he is in Elizabeth Wilson's translation. Um, when anger rages, uh, Agamemnon says, brutality and crimes against humanity abound. So now, Agamemnon is on shaky moral grounds, of course, having sacrificed his own daughter, Iphigenia, in order to have the wings work. But here, in Seneca's moral meditation, a gruesome slaughtering on a ghost's marriage bed, which even if it doesn't violate the laws of war, just bend them too far, it ought not be permissible. He will try to set the postbellum rules of engagement. Agamemnon says, I will not allow it. The faults of all my men return to me. Allowing a crime you stop is instigation, omission is commission. As we put it, it's gratuitous, it's disproportionate, and it is, goes against postbellum rules. There's no military purpose. Pyrrhus can only lamely reply, mercy often means giving death, not life. He clearly loses the moral argument, but wins the move. For he has the gods behind him, and to the Roman fascination in feasting on a spectacle of hideous savagery. And what happens next is a torch-lit wedding procession 
where the young maiden resolutely facing Pierce's blows. As blood gushes out from a massive gaping wound that soaks the ground of the ghost wound. <coughs> and his tomb is essentially, Achilles' tomb is essentially gushing out blood. But this isn't the most gruesome spectacle the audience will see, and this brings us right back to the beginning of where I started. The baby boy Astyanax, cast by the Greeks as future warrior boy, must face his fate too. His mother, Andromache, is in a mortal battle with Ulysses to protect her child. She's even hidden the young boy in Hector's tomb. Until now, she assures herself, and this is a very contemporary theme for us, tombs have been sacred. Sacred, though temples destroyed as part of the obliteration of the enemy. There's some discussions about cultural uh, annihilation of culture in war. The boy may be crushed and smothered by his father's corpse, but it's a chance she'll take to keep him from Ulysses' crutch. And so she begs Ulysses for mercy, for kindness, to ease a mother's woe of war. The boy is no threat, she says, too young and without any power backing or backing to rearm a city. Can this boy raise an army? Can he raise these ruins, this wreck of a city turned to dust, she asked. If this is all of the hope of Troy, there is no hope. So the absence of hope here is predictive, but also normative, about both the future and about what, what one may reasonably aspire on behalf of this child. There is no future for Troy and no point in entrusting <coughs> that end to him. The boy may be royal, she says, but he's as good as a slave. Just put a yoke on his royal neck. So to kill him is a crime of war, protests Andromache, and the atrocity will be pinned not on the gods, but on the Ulysses. But again, a Greek warrior set on vengeance, and the anger of vengeance cannot stay the impulse, an impulse that Seneca talks so much about in her way, on anger. I wish I could be merciful. I wish I could, but I could not. The transmission of war, you might say, goes on transgenerationally, the violation of war's relations. So again, that spectacle feeds the Roman hunger for gruesome violence. A throng, Trojan and Greek, gathers from far and near to see the grandson of Priam meet his end. Some climb on trees, Seneca tells us. Others stretch on their toes to get a peek at the impending violence. They're watching, Seneca tells us, in a space, a space that itself mimics the slogan and closure of the theater. So he set up a war cry, seeing that it is itself the theater within the theater. Again, this young one shows stoic demeanor, like his cousin, even though the very theme of the play is about emotions excess. Maybe Seneca is telling us that it's only the morally naive who, along with a perfect sage, can be free of all distress. After Ulysses chants the prophet's prayers, the boy steps off the steep embankment that was once the site of his grandfather's watchtower, Priam's watchtower. As Janus, his body immediately shatters with the impact of the plunge. His corpse is mangled. His skull cracks open. Brains spurt out. A little boy pulverized as if by a high impact bomb. Pleas of leniency, entreaties to restrain a victor's revenge, reminders that these children are victims, not contributors to war. The impotency, impotency of a ghost warrior group. Reminders that the aggression of war is over. None of this stays the hand of ruthless rage. Now, this is a strange play for a moralist of calm. Or maybe not. Or maybe it's a cautionary tale by Seneca about excessive punishment and the difficulty of staying the impulse of revenge in war. But it's also about leniency in a more general way in the face of overzealous punishment, whether directed at an external enemy or an enemy within. So, so just return to where we began to look at this talk. We began with naval aviator Lake McDowell. There was no formal investigation of the incident over Kosovo. 
It's not clear if there was a violation of polar procedures that were made to have been followed, the accident would have been averted. What we know is that McDowell, above all else, is his own judge. And he revisits the scene in flashbacks and in interviews with his shooters. Presumably, he also revisits the scene as he checks for accuracy. Chitters typed up a count of his quotes, and then later the full book, which Chitters said he has to look at. What he pictures is strikingly like that of Seneca's subject, a young boy's demise, a, body, a boy's body shattered, the back of his head missing, an innocent made all too vulnerable in war. What we hope for, for this Navy pilot, is some mitigation of the self-punishment, some leniency, some self-forgiveness that allows for a way to move beyond the rage of distress without losing the moral meaning of collateral damages, accidental killings, or insights that may come from the anguish. As I say, Seneca is a strange moralist of calm. For what sometimes parades as conscience is the rumbling of the unconscious and its conflicts. He yearns for simplicity and tranquility as one who's attracted to the messy world of high state power and violence. Modern day warriors also live in a complicated high state moral world. They yearn desperately for autonomy and self discipline, but they're willing to be in institutions that can vastly limit that control. They're exposed to situations that constantly test their best judgment and capacity for steady restraint. Exposure to moral injury is no surprise in that environment. But the Seneca lesson I'm urging is that that very injury may be at times part of moral growth and the beginning of the calm of moral repair. To read Stoicism as forswearing the possibility of good moral Stress, is just to miss Seneca's more profound teachings about moral growth and resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sherman. And uh, uh, Professor Sherman has told me she'll take some questions. Uh, if anyone has any, and then also. Um, she has a couple copies of her books, After War and The Untold War, I think, um, to sign if anyone's interested in uh, reading those copies. So I first want to say this is not Annapolis, it's not Colorado Springs, and it's not West Point. But where is it? Wish it on anyone, you know, the, the self 
punishment uh, that, that you talked about. But someone who could do that and not could not do that in the sense that he intentionally, but could be the subject of that, um, of those actions, the agent, and not feel haunted by it. That would seem to me like um, something less than some, some, some failure of humanity. Um, and, and so it strikes me that the fact that moral distress is instrumentally valuable because it'll help you do better next time, that might be true. But that's not the only thing that seems to me. That's good. Like, there, must be, there must be more that's important. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I need to present, it is, um, I was thinking of healing in a larger way, not just that it would be better next time, but so that um, presuming that you are feeling some sort of, we can call this for the agent or a grant, or whatever, you know, uh, moral law, and the um, feeling that you wish it didn't have to happen that way, your proximate causal agent, but not moral, uh, moral responsible or culpable. And the, if you didn't feel that kind of connection with the loss that came about through even, even if accidentally, there would be a way in which you, you fail to be connected humanly or humanity-wise with Soften, even if there's no fault. Okay, so you know, fault doesn't always capture it well, but connectivity, I take it that's what Bernard Williams does, Wolf, et cetera, all those kinds of um, feelings. So it's the Stoics are, I'm moving, you know, I was trying to move this in the Stoic fashion. The Stoics aren't particularly interested in kumbaya or <laughs> in. The connectivity and what are some, you know, what, what Kant might be interested really, what, what counts as science of humanity and being a member of a kingdom of ends or something like that. It, it, that kind of social reintegration is not really what the Stoics are very much interested in the moral progress. And I think um, you could, maybe I could widen, I didn't mean to say by adapt, I think adapted does sound functional and instrumental, so I didn't mean to suggest it narrowly in that sense. I think there's, you know, is a more is a complicated matter. Even a very just war with very just conduct in very um, in the, the best scenario, it makes it very hard for individuals um, in terms of their roles or persona to integrate easily. It's because you just typically do not. Uh, engage in that level of lethality and making individuals like what's killing that should be killed as in, in civilian life as you do in wartime scenes, that's all. And it's, so it's very hard, even if you don't want to call that moral transgression, it's still a kind of psychological dissonance that's created. And being able, I, in some cases, you know, connecting the, the sadness, the grief, the remorse of the public of, of a loss of a child is, is a, I, I agree with you, it's a humanizing thing. So I didn't mean to, sure, yes, didn't mean to make it only instrumental for, for, for future repair. I think the moral progress is more of the enrichment of the way in which you can stand fully human um, after coming out of the world or experiences like that. Yes, please. I remember recently, I remember recently when our president accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. In his acceptance speech, uh, he said, uh, 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 he mentioned that the, the reason for the rationality of war was, was related directly to the, the limits of man's ability to reason. And our military leaders today must bring that topic up now and then to justify the decision to go to war. I'm assuming that that's what they do from time to time, or have done for the last 100 years. Oh, so um, I, it's, a, it's a public debate. It's not just military leaders. Right now, we're fighting wars that um, uh, without full authorization of the use of wars. So these are um, public. They're, I would say, as a society, we've been woeful horrifically remiss in how we sent troops to war. And if it were their conscription, it probably would be different. But 
debate can be robust. Um, sons and daughters, husbands and wives would be um, those who be sent, and the conversation would be totally different. And if there were national service, you know, uh, I don't know how it would go. There still may be a lot of stratification within stratification within national service where some people are in the engineer corps, some are in the technical, some are in the teaching corps, and some are in the military corps, and that may just be a duplicate for the government. So the national service conversation is a large one, but I think it's not just Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just couldn't see. Oh, yeah. 
Um, I think the, the question of agency is really interesting here, and I'm curious how you see that kind of bear in more collective social situations. Like, for example, like the first example we gave, where it really was an unfortunate situation and it caused a factor out of the social control. Yes. yes. I think that's interesting in that in that situation there's a way in which I think you could say that that soldier isn't necessarily any more culpable for that action than say the average American taxpayer, where because it's coerced, these like the participation in the system is still coerced, whether it's socioeconomically, culturally, anything. But there's really kind of there's a way that you can say that there's no real difference. But in that case, I I think you could argue that there's kind of a lack of the appropriate moral response on the part of the public. And that's, a, that's a great question. Of, yeah. And, yeah, that's a great question, and I think you're spot on. Um, Seth Lazar is someone who works on just war theory, um, and he, there's a very uh, robust argument that can be made for um, um, different levels of contribution. We, yes, we are contributors. And we're contributors um, as part of a collective agency. So you're right about that. And we have, just as there's corporate responsibility, there's social responsibility for the ways in which we are contributors. But if we're all combatants, then are we all liable to killing? It, assuming we're, assume we're, now I'm going in the direction of Jeff McMahon, who's some philosophers who his work. Assume we're unjust combatants, because the war that we're fighting is unjust, or futile, or something like that. So assume, just assume that. Um, well, that means we're all, and we pay taxes, and we haven't selectively withheld our tax for that purpose. Not that it's clearly how you do that. Um, sh shouldn't we all then, if we're all combatants, and we all are equal contributors, well, the issue is equal, we're all contributors on some continuum, Aren't I as liable to killing by the enemy as my husband is a computer scientist who may occasionally work for the Defense Department but not knowingly, or the guy in the you know at the post stores um, making the uniforms, you know, go on down the line of all the ways in which we contribute to war. One way is to say if you're not if you're not contributing to the war effort per se, but just to the humanity of the person putting food on the table for someone, then you're not a war contributor. But if you're paying taxes that somehow are substituted to be designated, or omission, you fail to protest, yeah, that's how that argument goes. And, and we're in total war. And there's no combatants, we're all in it. <laughs> it's a prop. It's a dip. It's, it t makes you take very seriously your responsibility for a nation going to war, and that's what you've raised. And I think it's a really, really important question. But I just will say also, issues of co of, of agency, collective agency, is a hard nut to crack. I mean, I've thought a lot about that, and it's, I don't. I'm not a um, philosopher of action who works in that area specifically, but it's hard, and there are people. Who that's pretty touching. Well, thank you again for the